Okay, now we can get started. I don't know what it's long. Um, but uh, let's say the number is 64. And today we're going to talk, we're going to finish talking about TBD, which we started a little bit last time. Um, and then we'll talk about Benford's law and percentiles. I'm not sure how much that will get into today. Um, but we'll see how it goes. So midterm grades uh sooner later this week. Um as uh so I don't I don't understand why I don't always just run an auto grader, but using the uh, assignment mechanism in uh grade code did not work as well as I would like. So uh there's more manual grading than we were hoping for. Uh so that's gonna take, like I said, later this week. Um so to get started, TBD again, not the vampire diaries. Um, but this is, we talked a little bit about this last time. So basically looking at the Almeida count of very pools. Um, so we have the, sorry, can you all hear that? Not just in my head. Um, so we have eligible juries, jurors in a county, then the list of eligible residents, and then we create a jury panel from there, we create a jury. Uh, and so what we need to do though, is make sure that the people are actually being selected at random. And so the way we can do that is by using a little bit of Python. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to kind of tell you that the way the ethnic makeup of this county was at this time um, in whatever, 64, I think, um, looked like this. So basically 15% were Asian, 18% were Black. 12% were Latino, 54% white, and then 0.1%, or sorry, 1% were other. Um, and so when we want to look at that, uh, so so they, uh, let me just kind of show this thing, it makes sense. Um, so we end up just kind of creating a table that looks like that so we can kind of see what we're talking about. Uh, and the reason is we want to be able to compare this uh, to the tables themselves. So if we look at the blue, here, what we're seeing is that this is the makeup we expect, okay? And the yellow is the makeup of the actual juror candidates, okay? And as you can see, there might be some disparities there, right? So what we want to know is kind of like that other example we talked about is like, how how different is it, right? Because well, is it possible due to chance or is this so far out in the field or so far out in the outlier that uh, it's really, really unlikely? So the way we do that, if we create our model like we were talking about, okay, and then we can create our barrel, right, based on that model. And so we end up with this uh, simulated example. So we just take sample proportions again, but this time we're going to say, okay, I want 1,423 um, because that's how many jurors were in all the panels, okay? Um, and so, and then we're going to use our model to distribute the colors of the uh, marbles that we have in our barrel, right? Remember, it's an infinite size barrel, but we know the ratio of all the different colors in the barrel. So then we can say, okay, pull 1,400 of those out, and now we have what should be a random distribution. So it should, right, in a perfect world, it would come out to be exactly the same distribution, but it's likely it's going to be near it, right? So that's just one. And so we're going to throw that oops, we're going to throw that into our table as well, and then look at oops, a bar chart of now our simulation. And so what you should notice here, right, is that the blue bar, or the, sorry, the light blue bars at the bottom, and the dark blue bars at the top uh, are very close, right? Um, they're going to not be perfect a lot of the time, right? Like this one here, because of that random chance, right? All I did was reach into the barrel and pull out some marbles and this is kind of what I ended up with, right? So that's what we expect. But we also notice that the yellow, which was the real world, does not look like that. Oops, hold on. All right, so going back to our slides. So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, hey, this is the kind of problem that we can apply this rule set to, which is that with the people of the panels are multiple ethnicities, so we have multiple groups, okay? And then the distribution of those ethnicities is categorical, 
And so what we want to do is find out the distance between those two categorical distributions, right? Does that make sense? So like if you look at it from the picture perspective, it's like we want to find a way to measure how far away the yellow is from the dark blue or the yellow is from the light blue to kind of say, hey, this is how far away it is, because then we can say, oh, is this, you know, we can throw it on that graph like we did before, and is the, you know, the red dot, is it far outside of the range or is it kind of within the range? But we need a way to measure the, um, the, well, like the distance between the distributions, and that's what we use the DVD for. So we use the total variation distance, so for each category, we compute the difference in proportions between the two distributions. Then we take the absolute value of each difference, we sum it, and then we divide the sum by two. Okay, so we talked about that a little bit last time, but now we will demo it. So this is just kind of a reference or like kind of back rec. So let me make sure my cheat sheet is telling me what to do next. Okay, so oh, I forgot I forgot a cell in the prior section. Um, so it's weird. I have a I have a bug in my slides directives. Okay, so before we do that, we just kind of look at those gifts. So here's how we do it for the prior example. So we would say theory dot uh, column. And we say panels, okay? Because remember, we made that table up here that has all our various panels. And then we want to subtract that from the jury column of eligible. Let's see if I spell that correctly. And then we can actually make a new column of the difference, okay? So what I did was I took the one column and subtracted it from the other column, but I used the column uh, method, which will give back an array. So I can take two arrays and subtract them from each other, which means subtract each element from each other and produce a new array of just the results. Okay. Then I take that new array of just the results and I throw it on the table using the column. It is called difference. Okay. So so that's the difference, or sorry, it's the distance between our eligible and our panels. Okay. And again, we're just trying to get to like a useful number here, right? Because so I was kind of saying in the last lecture, we don't actually care what the number is per se. We care that we can measure a distance in a consistent way to say, is this thing close or is it far? All right, so continuing and ignoring that slide's directive, we're gonna make a little function that will calculate the TED for us, okay? So, what should I put here? Can we remember from the slide a minute ago? Yeah. Um, abscess one plus abscess two mm -hmm. divided by two. Uh, close. Um, so just one minus this two, right? Um, and then divided by two, but we forgot. Oh, no, that's right. Uh, and we forgot one quick step, which is that we want to sum those results. Mm -hmm. Wait, yeah, okay, so now we have a function that will actually calculate that total variation distance. So going back to the slide for a second. So for each category, we do the difference in proportions. So that's that subtraction. Then we take the absolute value of this of the difference. Okay, so if we go back here, instead of using uh, negative 0.1, right, we're going to use 0.1. And then we're going to sum that, and then we're going to divide the, total, the sum by two. Okay. So now we have what's called our observed TED. So here, here's our single number that kind of represents the difference. Okay. So now we say, okay, from the panels and the eligible, this is what we actually saw in practice, or the ACLU saw in practice in LA County. Um, and it was a distance of 0.14, okay? So numbers often don't really mean it except in context, right? So, um, so oh, yay, right, is the right answer to that number. So what we want to do now is we're going to start to test 
is that number close or far in terms of distance between the eligible and the panels themselves? Because we know we kind of know all the inputs, right? So we can we can sample or we can simulate um, what it it could have been, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do one example, okay? Um, and so we run our sample proportions, okay, with what we pass it into CVD. So this is we're just kind of casting them together. So we're going to say, okay, pull one set of marbles out of the barrel and then compare it to eligible and then calculate that distance. And here we see 0 0.02, okay, between this one random sample. And uh, and uh, what what is the perfect proportion, right? So that's not real close to that number, probably. Not that I cheated and know what the outcome is going to be. Really. All right. So now we want to make a function, right? Or uh, sorry, we want to kind of do a block that will um, kind of do that work for us. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually simulate the TBD. So I'm going to take that prior line. And then call it with the sample proportions, just like I did before. Except um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of simulate the whole TBD calculation versus the TBD function, which just did it one time. Um, and so then we will make an array of all the TBDs, right? And then we do kind of the same thing we've been doing. But let me make sure I get my variable names right. Um, So we're just going to call our simulated TBD. And we're just going to append it to this array. So TBDs dot append um, TBDs new TBD. Okay, so that's going to take a minute to run, right? Oh, you have a bug. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Um, that's different languages mixing in my head. Okay, so I think I have an actual output. I don't think so. No. Okay. So, uh, so now we're gonna we're gonna take the kind of data we just generated, and we're gonna throw that into a way to to view it, right? And so now our observed TBD, which I'm really gonna figure out how to get rid of. So, oh, I can do this thing. You know. Um, so our observed TBD was 0 0.14, right? And here is 10, I think it was 10,000 simulations. Um, and what do we see here? Okay. Where is, where is our observed TBD? There it is. The third bin? Uh, no. You mean here? It, or is it third? No, you mean that no, that's the fourth. The one on the left. Third. Okay. Yeah. So no. What what is that number? It's point one four, right? It's way over there, right? Because that's only point oh one, and this goes only up to whatever called point oh five. Right, it's way over there somewhere. So that's very far away. Okay, so so basically, kind of the, the crux of that story, right, is that we can use these two categories to we, we can measure the distance between these categories by using this TDD calculation. All right. So why is that interesting? Because at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is create a set of tools that we are aware of that we can use to actually do hypothesis testing. Okay, so we talked about this as hypothesis testing or AB testing or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a bunch of different names for it, but we have our null hypothesis, which is usually the thing we can test, and then the alternative hypothesis, which is the opposite. So it's really important that you make sure that they 
uh, completely are on opposite sides. Um, that can be harder than it sounds. And so the distribution of all potential control scores is the same as the distribution of all potential treatment scores. And so this specific example was talking about the Botox situation, um, but you get the idea. So what I wanted to show was, um, and the last slide of these, this series, I think is really useful for like studying. Um, but basically we have four kind of tools for doing this testing and they apply in different scenarios. Okay, so anybody here is taking common core math, uh, one of the things that I really like about it, and I talked about this with somebody in here, I don't remember who, um, but is that they they teach you math in terms of, hey, you have this strategy for this scenario and that strategy for another scenario, that there's not these universal strategies with the way I was taught math. The same goes true here, is that you have this kind of input condition, okay, like a scenario that you need a way to do, you want to test your hypothesis with, but this scenario won't necessarily work for one that doesn't meet this characteristic. Okay, so we have one category in this characteristic, and so we're going to look at the empirical percentage and the absolute value of the empirical percentage minus the null percentage, and how to simulate this. We use sample proportions with, um, you know, a, a size, which is usually based on the observed example, um, and then your distribution of the, you know, of your bucket. So. I know the terminology here is a little uh, more precise than I've been using, but hopefully you get the idea. But the example I think should be helpful is that, hey, we're just looking at the percent of flowers that are purple, right? So that was our hypothesis, is that we think a certain percentage will be purple. And so we construct our test like this, okay? So that's one category. Then we also have one sample with multiple categories. And this is where we use the TDD, okay? So our test statistic is really, well, sometimes it's really both of these, okay, that are that can vary between them. But so what is the test statistic? In this case, it's the TDD. And then we simulate it by using sample proportions, kind of similar to the prior one, um, but we use a different test statistic to do the comparison of null alternative. Okay, and so the ethnicity of distribution of period panel plus in parentheses is uh, the example for this kind of scenario. Then we have like numerical data, okay? So instead of categorical data, we have numerical data. And so in this case, we might have the scores of, you know, I don't know, like the midterms, right? That you took in the lab section. Um, and then this is the test statistic, okay? So you take the mean and the absolute value of the mean minus the null mean, okay? Uh, and then you take, this we use sample here, okay, on the population data and with replacement equal to false. So without replacing. Okay. That's kind of this scenario. And then the kind of the last one that we're going to talk about today is this last tool, which is when we have numerical data, we have two samples, right? We have smokers and non-smokers, and we have so then what we do is we essentially take the mean minus the mean and the or the absolute value of the mean minus the mean. Um, and we use the sample method again with replacement equal to false, except we need to make sure, and this is a little subtle, but we need to make sure in this case, we can kind of choose a sample size, right? That's what the N is at the very bottom, right? Whereas in this one, we have to use the whole sample, right? Because the shuffling doesn't work unless we use that for the same. Okay. So this is just the same thing in a nutshell. Um, can you explain the difference between how to simulate and the test statistic? Yeah, so the test statistic is what you're measuring and the simulation is how you get more of those, right? So, you know, in this case, right, we can use the sample method for the how to simulate but we have to use the whole data set that we had, and we do it without or we do it with uh, without replacing. You never say that right. Um, but what we're measuring is the is the difference between the two means and the two averages. Whereas in this one, we can take a, a smaller sample set potentially. Got to be careful of how small it gets, but you get the idea. It doesn't have to be the complete set, um, and 
we're going to use the empirical mean, or we can also use the subtraction of the absolute value of that. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in here in that you might find one of those answers a better choice than the other in some particular scenario, but both of them are valid. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know, like I said, I think this can be a little bit confusing. So you'll you'll be doing these a bunch more times using individual like actual examples. But if you kind of come come back to this, it'll tell you like. Oh, hey, I was, you know, the lab or the homework said to do this kind of modeling. Oh, hey, it looks like this one, right? And so that's why I chose that. So if you're presented with one where it doesn't tell you which one of these to use, you'll have you'll have ways to recognize. It. And we'll talk about it more too. All right. So at the end of the day, what we really care about here, right, is causality. So this is kind of another way of thinking about the same thing. We have, how did we get our data? Kind of the first question, okay? Did we do an observational sample, right? Or did we do a randomized controlled experiment? So this is the difference would be the smokers and non-smokers with the birth weights. That was an observational sample. They just took measurements of the birth weight of the children who came to the hospital and had, you know, women came to the hospital and had children and asked them were they smokers or non-smokers, okay? Whereas a randomized control experiment is you could go out and seek people to participate in your trial. Okay, like medical trials, really good example. And so I'm sure you've seen ads for them on the uh, subway um, all over town. Uh, some of them, uh, Harvard is a big place for them, the use a big place for them. So, kind of how do you get your data? Then, what does that data look like? Is it two sample, in this case, like let's say it's two sample numerical data? Okay, well, then that means we should use shuffling labels to simulate from the null. And then if it works, right, then we get causal relationship. If it doesn't work, it's just an association or a problem. Okay, so I don't, I didn't make graphs of kind of each of these scenarios. Maybe I should do that when it says. Um, but that's kind of what you're doing. So you're going through this workflow and saying, okay, I have, I have this kind of input, right? And so therefore, I, I, this means I have this kind of data. So this means I should use this kind of method to test my hypothesis. All right. So, however, can a conclusion be wrong? Okay. So, so going back to what I just showed a minute ago, we got a 0 0.14, which was way out of our, our distribution. It could still be true. Okay. It's just really, really unlikely. Right. So, the X is here basically, it's where it wasn't, you know, that's not the case. So, um, but the point is, is that we're, we're still kind of guessing, okay? We're guessing with a certain amount of accuracy and that's where the P value comes in. And I think that's the next slide. So the, this, I think it's, it can be a little bit confusing is that we have the cutoff for the P value and we have the P value itself, okay? So before we run the experiment, we decide Okay, what is an acceptable cutoff for the p-value? We say, okay, let's say it's five percent. Okay, then that means we'll be statistically significant. Um, and but you're you're supposed to, you know, you may have done this like in a science class where you're supposed to come up with a hypothesis before you run your tests, right? And so this is part of coming up with a hypothesis is like where in that you know graph can an example be? To be still considered either part of the null, so like on the inside, or part of the alternative, so kind of on the outside. So how far in can we go? And if you say five percent, it's, it's two and a half percent on each side. So if I pull a random sample, it's still part of the alternative, even if it goes into the null up to five percent. That makes sense. So just to kind of explain the difference between the two, the p-value cutoff does not depend on the actual data, right? It's some arbitrary measure that you're going to take in advance that says, this is what I'm going to declare will indicate what, what's the right answer, okay? And commonly, they are 5% and 1%. Um, you have to have a really good reason for using something outside of those, 
essentially two. You don't you don't really see three percent either. Okay, so it's like five percent and one percent. Um, and it, but it's just the convention, right? It's just most people would agree. You know, most people who do this kind of work would agree that it's statistically significant if it's within five with a five percent cutoff versus highly statistically significant with a one percent cutoff. Um, and yeah, and so basically what you're looking at is the probability of where if you take another sample, okay, and so that sample could be simulated or observed, right? So we could go do another study of looking at the birth weights of babies in hospitals, and if we, we gather all that data, it's observed data, right? It should still follow these rules, okay? So in other words, because remember our null hypothesis was that uh, birth weight of children would be unaffected by smoking, but we showed that the alternative was true, which is that they were affected by smoking. So even if we do another study, an actual study, it should fall in the alternative, okay? Given the 5% or 1% cutoff. Um, if, uh, but we could also run another simulation. So if I go and run, you know, the 10,000 and first example, I should also still be in that same range. Okay? I may not get exactly the same number as I've ever gotten before, but I should still be in that range. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about this thing called Benford's Law, which is pretty cool. Has anybody ever heard of Benford's Law? All right. You might have, because it made the news a lot in like, what was it? 2016 um, with the election, but we'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, okay, so Benford's law looks like this. And I think it's kind of mind blowing if you've never seen it before. So if you get a set of numbers, okay, like just a bag full of numbers, why you're getting a bag full of numbers, let's just say Santa was really mean that year. But you got a bag full of numbers. When you pull out those numbers, the proportion of the first digit, okay, will look like this. Okay, as long as those numbers kind of vary in size in what's called orders of magnitude. So, like, you don't just have numbers that are like in the hundreds. Okay, you also you have hundreds and thousands and ten thousands and millions and you know single digits, etc. But if you if you do have that kind of distribution, the first digit will be wildly likely to be a one, okay? And then it falls off after that, which is super interesting. Uh, there's math, it's a law, so it's true. Um, even though I, I, I see some cases, right, that indicate gut instinct tells you that it's not true, but it is actually true. And if you if you kind of start to think about it, right, um, it kind of starts to make sense if you try to think of random numbers or whatever, but the, the ones tend to be more often. So Benford's law has been used uh, correctly and incorrectly a large number of times, particularly in politics. Um, okay, so to get that first digit, anybody have any ideas how I can get just like I have I have a number and I just want the first digit? How do I do that? Any ideas? So I have the number is two thousand. First digit from the right. First digit on the left, like the very first digit. So 2000, the two. All right. So you actually know all the tools for doing this. But what I can do is I can say, well, first, let's turn it into a string. Okay. And then we can say, you know what? Give me the first one, the first character. And then I can convert that back to an integer. And now I have a function that will return just the first digit. Okay. And remember, turning it into a string it essentially turns it into an array. So I can index into that array. If I want the very first position, I get a U0 and bang them up. So first digit will now give me a three or a one as expected. Okay, so we have this counties table where uh, I haven't written some of the code yet. Um, and 
Oh. Yeah, I'm just going to fill this in. Um, I'm not sure why I made that an example of you. Okay, so I have now uh, this set of data. It's all the populations of all these counties uh, throughout the U.S. Okay, so um, each of these counties, uh, you know, all we're going to do is relabel it a bit because the columns have some weird names because I think originally census data. Um, and so we're going to call it state, county, and the population of that term. So that way we have these three columns. And so now what I want to do is I want to get all those first digits because I want to know if this follows Benford's law, right? So how do we know how I, what method I can use here to um, get the first digits? Uh, apply maybe? Yeah, apply, exactly. Um, this should be one of your favorite methods. Um, and then we're just going to pass in the method I just wrote, which is not perfect. Also, I'm looking at the wrong part of the cheat sheet. Okay, so now I'm just grabbing that first digit off of each one, putting in a new column called first digit. And so now I have that directly on the table. So I can work with it without having to kind of recalculate it every time. Um, so the next thing I do is I just tend to look at what's the size of it uh, so that I can now maybe construct some bins. Um, so why did I do it? Oh, yeah, we're not doing bins yet. So, okay. So what we can see is that if we Take those counties and look at the first digits, it does follow Benford's proportion. So, what, or it seems to, right? We can test for it. So, does anybody have any theories about what this Benford's law might be useful for, where it is accurate and people do uh, use this? There's a really good example, which most of you probably have very little experience with. Tax fraud, exactly. So people are very bad at making up random numbers. If you're making up random like income numbers, uh, you tend to not follow things like Benford's law. So if you run a bunch of uh, IRS tax forms through Benford's law and you're getting numbers that are not in that distribution, it means you probably have some fraud in there. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. And it also kind of tells you where, right? Because it tells you, hey, these numbers aren't following the distribution. Okay, so what I wanted you to do was, um, you know, hopefully you're all following along, but let's say we want to test this county theory, okay? So we want to know if the counties are following Benford's law or not. So what should our null hypothesis be? All right, yeah. They both the counties don't follow the law. Um, so, oh, sorry. No, so the, the, the null is actually so that they do follow the law. Okay, and the reason is this is one of those ones I get mixed up every time because I always expect the null to be what I don't want. Um, so, the reason is, is because what we can test here is we can test them against Benford's law. But we can't test like that they're not following the law, right? Yeah, so what we want to do is for our null hypothesis, we want to actually say, um, or so county population follows Benford's law. Right, and so because what I can do is I can now run a simulation of county populations and test and see if it's close to the Benford, uh, Benford law or what Benford would expect. Okay. So that makes the alternative what? Yeah. 
What is it? Right, so that it doesn't follow. So it's just the opposite. Oops. It's not follow. All right. All right. And so given that, what test statistic should we use to figure this out? What do you think? So we're comparing two populations, right? Right, here I'll maybe make these ones. So if I'm comparing two populations, what test statistic do you think I should use? Or the last one. So, so the last one seems like the right answer, except are the numbers that we're working with really numerical or are they categorical? Right? Do I care that a one is less than a two when I'm comparing it to Benford's law? Right, you're shaking your head. Is that a new response? It's the second one because because you're just like comparing proportions of different categories. Right. It doesn't matter what the categories. Right. You don't really care what the numbers are. You just care the fact that they're categories. So you want to compare them. So that's what TV is for. All right. So TV. And then do we want, or which one is going to favor the alternative? So do we expect bigger or smaller values to favor the alternative? Okay. And if you remember from the prior example, I showed one. Wait a minute. Remember, they're all absolute, right? So so the number, so we have we have kind of a uh, what do I usually call it? Um, kind of an amplitude rather than a direction. So what do you think? So imagine the graph and where that, you know, my red dot is. Is it going to be a bigger number or a smaller number? And remember, we're starting at zero because I did absolute value. There it is. All right, so we want a bigger number, right? So bigger numbers will be into the alternative. Yeah. All right, so how do we do that? We just start to calculate it out, just like we were doing before. So we just do some as the value of the proportions <laughs> minus the per model, um, which I used above, and then divide that whole thing by two. Okay, so now we have an observed TDD. Um, again, still doesn't really mean anything because we don't have anything to like compare it to. But we know it's 0 0.02, right? So then we kind of move on to okay, now let's do a simulation, right? And then we're going to turn that into a, a function. Uh, but really, this is where we kind of actually start to do our test. So we're going to do for 10,000 times, we're going to uh, simulate the frequencies of those populations by sampling the proportions, right? And getting out data from the counts. Um, and then lastly, we'll just throw it into a table, or sorry, a table and a histogram. But now we have our, oh, I'm gonna have to explain the observed. So the observed, right, was 0.01 or 0.02. 
Um, and so 0 0.02, that's pretty good, right? It looks like it's kind of right in the middle of our distribution, which probably means that it's favoring towards the north. And so the question is, are the data consistent with, um, with the null hypothesis? And in this case, like I said, semi-unusually, because you feel like we're always testing for, like you always want the alternative. In this case, we do expect the company to follow Benford's law. And this state I mean, our simulation here seems to bear that out. Okay. Because we have the observed and then kind of the center of that graph um, is in there. All right. Going back to the slides. All right, so here was my, my real example. Um, so I want you all to read this to yourselves. And the first thing I'm going to ask you, let me just see how I leave this out of the slides. Yeah, so the first thing I'm going to ask you is kind of a little bit of a sidebar is point out some problems with this piece of text. And this is a, an exact image copy of, I think it was a tweet, but let's say social media. Uh, I can't remember exactly what. Um, but what, what do you see as some problems here as far as, the, you know, like how, how much should you believe this statement? Any ideas? Let's go back to something we talked about early on, kind of that bullshit factor. Uh, maybe in tight races, the numbers are different than in general races. I don't know. So you're talking about the actual thing. What I'm saying is on this literal text, what should you believe whoever this person is? It says Tom Cannon's proposal. Right. So, so some analysts, okay, that maybe means two, right? out of thousands, okay, that's still some, right? Or it could be 99 out of 100, right? So it, it's not, it's kind of scary when you see something like some animals. It says clearly fails and accept the capacity with evidence Yeah, so Biden pretty clearly fails to accept the test for catching election fraud. So the, the, the tweet or whatever it is, is alluding to the Benford's law being applicable to election um, and used by the State Department and forensic accounts. So this is great. How many, how many, so given how many people, how many people in the classroom have heard of Benford's law before today? Okay. So how common do you think it is in forensic analysis and used by the State Department? Another question would be, why is the State Department looking at election fraud in the U.S.? Because they have nothing to do with election fraud or elections. So, uh, what? Like, so there's there's a bunch of problems there with this accepted test with something very few people have ever heard of. Um, if it was being used every election cycle, let's say, you'd probably see that published in a newspaper, for example. Every election cycle, everyone in here would at least be familiar with the term, even if they weren't entirely sure what it meant, right? So, yes, some problems. Any other stuff? There's some. There's some really glaring things that don't even have to do with the language in the text. So, two big ones I'll point out. Are you got one? Okay, two big ones I'll point out. Random capitalization. Okay. Why are some of those words capitalized that don't shouldn't be capitalized? Okay, they're doing it to draw your eye. Okay. So clearly someone's trying to manipulate it. Another one, why are some of the words red? Right? They're trying to manipulate it. That's that's why. There is no there is no reason why some of the words are red. Okay. It's just trying to get your eye to focus on those terms so that you uh, give it more credence in this case, right? Where it's state department is called out, you know, and I don't even know, I'm not even sure why tallies would make me think a particular way, but the fact that it's red is clearly trying to get you to think a particular way. 
So here's some example. Uh, so some some you got some I mentioned. Um, so some analysts like who right um, tallies the State Department. Why are they highlighted red? You know, uh, and I don't know if you can tell from kind of the back that this is actually bolded as well as red. Um, so the font is heavier. Um, accept the test for catching election fraud. Like when did they develop this accepted test? Why is the State Department looking at election fraud? Uh, for example. So yeah. All right, but the real point here is about Benford's law. So a little bit of background. 70% of the votes in Milwaukee were for Biden, okay? Half of all awards, uh, so um, uh, basically you have uh, elections in the US, you have like kind of the state level, then you have um, the ward level, then you have the precinct level. So it's basically semi-arbitrary setups of uh, the districts that how people get elected. Um, so they have total votes from 570 to 1,200, and the average is about 800 per ward. Okay, they're not uniform in size, but they only vary between 500 to five, 570 and 1,200. The U.S. in if you're unaware of this is essentially a two-party system with a national level. So in other words, if there is a vote for Trump, it like the other alternative is Biden, right? There, there's a vanishingly small uh, third party candidacy, um, but usually doesn't have a material impact on like kind of numbers games in the US elections. All right. And so this was the evidence. Okay. So the theory here is so these are uh, by ward um, and the, the voting. And so this is the, the kind of the only two that matter here. Oh, sorry. This is the votes for all the candidates. So first we have Biden, then we have Trump. And then we have kind of all the rest. Um, and so those are largely ignorable. But the point being here, or the point this person was trying to make, is that Trump's votes, if you look at it, right, follow closely Benford's law, and Biden's votes do not. Okay, so the argument being that there was election fraud. And so the question is, is this an indication of election fraud? And you might have guessed, no. So any ideas why it's not? Because we did say, you know, you can use it on something like taxes, but you can't use it in this mechanism. Is that like random? Sorry? No, they are. I mean, they're still, they're still random in that sense, right? It's just like a tax, you know, uh, how much I made this year is still a quasi-random number, right? Yeah. Even though the chance is small, it doesn't mean that. Means. So it could just be random chance, right? Um, so that is certainly possible, but it's it's worse than that. And I haven't really talked about it too much. But remember when I first said if you had your big bag of numbers, they all have to be in varying sizes, different orders of magnitude. The numbers between 570 and 1200 are not different orders of magnitude. I mean, there's one, but there's not a lot of them. So it doesn't work when the sizes are really uniform. And you would actually hope that um, election grouping sizes should be pretty uniform across the country. Um, so as a result, you can't do this kind of analysis with this data um, because all of our ward sizes were are really close in size. And so Benford's law doesn't apply. And so this is where some of those things about like the tricks you use, if you don't apply them appropriately, they give you the incorrect results. Um, there's actually a ton of political science like papers of research of people trying to figure out how to get Benford's law to apply to elections. And there has been no success, um, like all using all different tricks. Um, but this is just one example. Um, and I was kind of hoping some of you might have seen this because it, it did make huge news uh, in 2016 during the election. Oh, sorry. No, this would have been 2020. Um, so long story short, um, Benford's law is useful because uh, it, it can give you this distribution, but only when the orders of magnitude are kind of wild and great. Um, and if you, if you actually dig into the map, if you kind of like try to calculate it, you could even see that it it just doesn't match up, right? Um, and so that's why. And, and on top of that, 
Trump's poor performance probably leads to why uh, he did well on ben, like compared to Bedford's law, which is kind of funny. All right. Uh, if you're interested, um, uh, a lot of people have recommended this Netflix um, digits episode. Uh, I haven't actually seen it, uh, but it's supposed to be really interesting. I have listened to the Radio Lab podcast. Strongly recommend Radio Lab in general. They have a lot of neat stuff. Um, but if you want to get more into it, um, so a counterexample of Benford's law is really what we're talking about. All right, kind of moving on to something completely different, um, and, which is percentile. So the question here is, what is the 80th percentile given this set of digits? Well, what we do is, and this is where um, it's kind of important because we do it here when we say percentile, it's a little bit different than when you say like, what's 50%, you know, where's the 50% of something. Um, and so what we do is we actually make sure they're in order, okay, like, like uh, in like numerical order, and then we do it by kind of position and the number has to appear. Okay, so in other words, um, I'm not sure why I should be unordered. Yeah, so we convert it and then we get to the order to element four because we want to say the 80th percentile. Okay. Um, yeah, and but counting from, wait. Yeah, so sorry, I got confused by the five and the seven. Um, but so the 80th percentile is the order to element four because when you divide 80 by 100 and then multiply it by the fifth, that's where you get to in the position. And so that's how we know what the percentile is. We're going to be using this. Um, in particular, we're going to be using it uh, using a function called percentile. So uh, I want you to know how it works. So the 50th percentile is order to element three in this case um, because even though it should be two and a half, that number doesn't appear. So we take the next one off, okay? So we take, in this case, we take five if we want the, the middle, okay? The 50%. Um, so instead of it being two and a half, it's actually three, um, which is probably slightly different than what you might expect. So it's not the kind of average, it's, the, it's that position. And, The reason we care, right, is because we sometimes care about the medians. And the next kind of block of ways of doing testing is using the median rather than the mean. And so we want to talk about how do we get to the median. So the median is the number at the 50th percentile um, because the number, as you probably all know, right, a median has to appear in the set, whereas an average does not, right? So a median must be there. So we can just use the percentile to say, okay, where's the 50th percentile? And that would be the median. Then this is just the example we filled in the answers. Um, and so, this is kind of the, the real explanation, which is the, you know, whatever percentile is the smallest value in a set that is at least as large as that percentage of the elements. Okay. So it has to be over whatever that number is. So if you know we want 50% and there's five of them, it would be two and a half. That means it's got to be the condition above that. Um and Oh, and then there's a function called percentile, uh, which if you tell it the percentage you want, and then the set of values, so like an array, it'll give you back that percentile. So it's really useful to get the median and mostly how we use it. So, So the first thing we do is we want to sort it, right? And conveniently, we can actually sort by using function called sort. 
Oops. And so that just goes back to the array sorted. Um, and so we can manually figure this out. Um, and then we can find out where. The... Yeah, so basically this is going to say. Sorry, I think it's an error. All right, so what we now do is figure out the 50th percentile. So one of the things um, that I pointed out that was a bug in the intern guide, this is modulus. Um, and so that'll be it's kind of like the remainder, right? Um, but the reason we care is because we need it to calculate this function, which would be. Sure. I don't think the stuff that's left out in this one is right. We should the rejigger in this one. Okay, so if we normally would try to compute where we want that position, right? Um we could end up with this kind of float position, which is kind of hard to work with, right? So what we have to do is we have to go grab it and we have to go around it, and then we can get the one that we actually want. So in other words, we take, first we do the division to figure out, okay, we want the, what was the 50th, the 55th percentile. So we divide 55 divided by 100, and then multiply that by the number of elements in the set until we get to, uh, the kind of the middle, which would be a 3.3. Okay. So then we take that 3.3 and then we look for the next number that is higher than that. And so that would be, but it's by position, right? So it's the fourth position. And so then we end up with the fourth position. But if we go back to our original array here, what is the fourth position? Well, it's 34. Does that make sense? Like I said, it's pretty straightforward. All you're trying to do is you you do a little bit of division to find kind of that middle point or that point that you want for the percentile, and then take the next digit above it. As long as the digits are sorted. And then we're gonna skip this part. Well, actually, I'll leave this here because there's a little bit easier way to do that, which is we can actually do. And remember, I'm converting to an int so that it does, loses its uh, decimal. Oh, I read it out. Okay, and so this is just a little bit different. I wanted to show you that there are also these other convenient functions like sealed, which is short for sealing. Okay, it's almost always short to seal, but it just means the top, so the next full number. Um, and then, so we can kind of calculate it that way as well. But the easiest way to do it is to actually use that percentile function. which we'll largely be using for median, but I will say this is something that is a very easy thing to test. Um, so it's likely that it would appear on an exam or a quiz or something. You don't really have quizzes, exam. All right. So just a couple of simple examples um, of those various percentiles and like I said, they should be pretty straightforward. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, but what we want to get to next, how are we going to uh, Okay. So kind of why are we doing a lot of this work, right? Is that we're trying to do estimations, right? So we want to know, um, you know, we have, we have this observed value, let's say. We want to know, is that, like the actual, you know, what happens, what happens is, is that observed thing where we expect it to be. So you can take the Alameda County uh, juror population, 
we have this observation of what actually ends up in the jury pools. Um, and then we can also do a simulation to say what should end up in the jury pools and compare those. So we're trying to do estimation. So this is kind of another way to think about some of the earlier slides, which is that first we have access to the census. And I want to point out, notice small c, okay? So census means a perfect set of data, okay? So large C census is the U.S. census, um, which is in theory a count of all the people in the U.S. So it is a perfect census with a small c. Okay, but when we say census like this with a lowercase c, what we mean is a full data set. Okay, versus like a sample. If we have access to it, we can just calculate the parameter. Right? We don't we don't need to do much of anything. We know we know we have very good data. And so we can just calculate whatever it is we're looking for. What is much more likely to have, right, is we have some portion of the census data. And so we are kind of on that no route, and we would take a random sample from it, and then we determine a statistic to do as an estimate, and then we calculate that statistic, and then we usually do it a bunch of times. All right, and so what we are starting to care about is like how is like kind of measuring our accuracy is how how correct are the things that we're doing and so obviously if we do one sample we, we get one estimate which may or may not be actually good right because randomness comes into play so who knows if it was a good one so maybe we should try it a bunch of times and so when we do that Let's say we do try it multiple times, or we want to do it on an individual level while we're doing going along. We want to quantify how uncertain we are, and so this is kind of the terminology we use for that, where we say if the estimate is equal to the parameter plus the error, and then the error is equal to the estimate minus the parameter. Right? It's just inverted. But if you notice, the error is random. We don't know what the error will be because it's a direct result of the random sampling we did. Right? And then the estimate is the kind of the thing we're looking for. So that's the variable. That's the thing that's going to change. And then the parameter, that's kind of whatever our input is. So that's going to be fixed. It doesn't change. I mean, it changes per test, but it doesn't change. It can't vary. Um, and then what we really care about, right, is that how big is the typical error? And if we if we have part of the census, we can do this by simulation. And so let's do it over and over again, because, and this is the big thing at the bottom here, is that we can't go back and sample again from the population because it costs too much money. So using the example of the smokers and non-smokers and birth weight, in theory, we could go to the hospitals and go collect that data again and do a bunch of observations, right? But it's expensive, both to like kind of collect the data, you know, the ethical boards or whatever, to find out if we should collect the data, as well as actually calculating it and you know getting it all together. So if we can find ways to simulate it, we're usually in much better shape. Let's just see what was some of this. All right. So what this is going to show is essentially doing estimation. Um, but kind of starting to leverage medias rather than averages or other other mechanisms. So the first thing we do is pull up. This is real world data that I got I don't know, a year or two ago uh, from data.boston.gov. So this is actually employees of the city and how much money they did um, because it is all public information. Um, and so this is just the table of that data. Couple of things, uh, you know, I, I'm up with the employee ID, so they can't be not back to real people. Um, not that I actually had to because it is public. Um, but then what department they work in, what their title is. Then the thing I want to point out really here is that they have regular pay, they have retroactive pay. So uh, this is where somebody has a job and they get a promotion, say, in February. But the, the, they get a salary raise for it, but that salary raise doesn't happen until, say, March. Okay, they'll actually be paid for whenever they got the original uh, promotion. Um, and so that would be retroactive pay. Other is exactly that. Other, 
some other way of making money overtime. So anytime they spent uh, outside of normal work hours, we got paid for injured. So they were injured on the job, but they still collected um, money, which isn't exactly salary at that point because it's it's kind of special. It comes out of insurance instead of coming out of normal pockets. And then detail, this is uh, something that's a little bit unique to uh, Boston, which is that there's a certain kind of overtime that the police can do, uh, which is called being on a detail. Um, and so that's paid for that. So like you ever seen a cop at a construction site, that's, a, that's actually a detail. It's not part of their normal work. Um, construction sites, uh, like funerals, that's another one where you do it on detail. Parades are often detail. Um, so it's kind of like, kind of like overtime, but it's overtime where you're doing not normal police work. So the reason I put all that out is because we can look at who is making the most money, because that's all we put more in. And how would we do that? So we can just sort the data by total earnings. And if you notice, now you see why I kept mentioning all the details about police, uh, because as you can see, police are far and away make the most money in the city. Um, in fact, the highest paid one um, a couple of years ago actually is right in the neighborhood of $300,000 a year. Um, seems like a lot as a cop. Um, and so, but let's try to look at what we care about in this particular case is let's look at people who make the least amount of money. Now, this is where we get into kind of some of that data cleaning problems, right? Which is that, okay, this employee, right? 381087 made 38 cents that year. Okay. That does not seem like a great salary, right? So what's likely here is that this person is actually a substitute teacher or a nurse. And so they didn't happen to work that year, but for whatever reason, they still got paid 38 cents. They didn't keep on the payroll, who knows, right? But so, so it's they're in here, but they're not really data. So maybe we want to try to exclude them, but we need to kind of exclude them like legitimately. So maybe what we think about doing is instead of just whacking anything that's less or anything that's equal to 38 cents, maybe we could do it like, and we do it based on a salary range. So in the US, we have something called minimum wage. Um, minimum wage is the minimum you can be paid. Uh, it is There's a, a number that is set at the national level that any individual state can either meet or exceed, but they're not allowed to go under it. So in Massachusetts, uh, this this keeps changing on me, so I can't remember if I'm correct, but I think it's uh, 1425 an hour, maybe. Um, but they, uh, a couple of years ago, they established policy to say it's going to go up by like a dollar a year, uh, up to 1550, I think. And I can't remember where we are in the, in the timeline. Is it 15? Um, okay, so it's 15 dollars an hour. Um, and then we work 40 hours a week, and then we will just say for the sake of argument, there's 52 hours or 52 weeks in the year. Um, there are actually pitch to be in here, but normally when you do calculations like this, you take out vacation, uh, which is typically usually used randomly in two weeks a year. So you usually use um, uh, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks instead of 52, which also can be, it comes out to be 2,000 hours. So it's either you and half um, So let's say 31 or 31,200. Um, and so now we can kind of instead now legitimately take out data by saying, you know what, we're actually going to remove anyone who's making less than minimum wage because we know they must be anomalous somehow, right? Because they're making less than minimum wage, so they're and they're not, you know, serving staff at a restaurant. They're making less than minimum wage, so we know that that salary, whatever they're getting, must be unusual. And so that's a very easy caveat we can make is that. We only looked at the data for employees who are making minimum wage or above. So, how do we do that? Well, we just pull it out. 
and we can just use the where to do total earnings. Um, oops. Actually, this would be inverse, but because we want to do both, mostly because I hate losing data. What is it? Okay, so now we have two tables, right? We have everybody who's kind of in that anomalous category, and now we've replaced our original table with only people making over that minimum wage. All right, and so now we can look at, we can kind of take that data set and now actually do some analysis on Boston employee data, controlling for whatever that weird anomaly or whatever weird anomalies might be below minimum wage. Um, so, we can create the some bins and we can look at where that population distribution is. Um, and what's kind of interesting here, right, is the vast majority of the population is between 50,000 and 150,000. Um, and then we start to have these outliers we're making a lot more money. So we can also pull a sample out of it so that we can start to do some modeling around this. We can actually come up with a hypothesis and try to figure out something interesting about it. For example, when we looked at, can we pull out the average? Yeah, so we can pull out the median. Um, I thought we had the average here too, but long story short, uh, we can use that percentile function to get the median, which is a lot easier. Um, and what I want to point out here is that top median is from calling NP median. If you notice, that number is different from the one we get by using the percentile function. So if I ask the median in this class, what we mean is that percentile at 50%, not that number. Okay. So don't use the NP median. 